Would anybody like to ask any questions about what's been going on or what's going on in the future? Anything you need to know? Am I home here okay? No, because we can use the reciprocal identities. And you don't need to know them. You just need to um, know how to use them. So I put a handout on Blackboard with all of the identities from chapter five. The top part of the handout says, you need to know these. And the bottom part says, I will give you these. So it might be a good time to start putting those in your head for those of you that don't already have them in your head. If I ask you for the three Pythagorean identities, could you give me, a, give me the Pythagorean identity with sines and cosines? Sine squared plus cosine squared is one. What about with tangents and secants? <laughs> the tangents and secants. <laughs> Tangent squared plus one is secant squared. And then with cosecants, it's one plus cotangent squared is cosecant squared. I might be able to pass this class. Okay. Do you have any questions before I get rocking and rolling here? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. A minus B? And you said this was web work number what? And so this would be 5152 web work? 5354. Okay, so you're told information about an angle A and an angle B. That business about three pi over two to two pi means both of those angles are in which quadrant? Quadrant four. Because three pi over two corresponds to the negative y axis on the unit circle, and two pi is the positive x axis. So this says that both of these angles are in quadrant four. And so I'm going to draw you both of those angles. Um, here's going to be angle A. So I'm drawing in quadrant four. That's the positive x axis. Then y is going down. And then the angle is formed with the x axis. So there's angle A. The cosine represents the length of the adjacent side and the hypotenuse. And so now we have to find the opposite side that I'm going to call y. Notice that y is going to be a negative number because in quadrant four, the y values go down in the y direction. So Pythagorean theorem says square root of 40 squared plus y squared is, 70, is seven squared. And so when I square that 40, uh, I lose the radical sign. <coughs> and seven squared is 49. So move the 40 over there with the 49 and I get y squared is nine which means y is going to be three. And remember we said we're going to take y to be negative three because it's going down. And now let's provide a triangle for angle B also in quadrant four. So let me draw it right here. The adjacent side there is the square root of nine. The hypotenuse is five. Now we're gonna find the negative value for that y. This one says the square root of nine squared plus y squared is five squared. So that'll give me nine without the radical sign. Five squared is 25. Subtract nine from both sides. 25 minus nine is 16. So I'm gonna get y to be negative four. <coughs> 
I know I need those because I know my difference formula contains sines and cosines. And so I'm going to write out the identity here that the cosine of A minus B goes cosine, cosine plus sine, sine. So cosine first angle, cosine second angle, plus sine first angle, sine second angle. I'm given the two cosine <laughs> values, so let's grab them from up here and put them down in their spot. Square root of 40 over seven, and this one's square root of nine over five. Now from each triangle, the sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So the sine of angle A is negative three over seven, and the sine of angle B is negative four over five. And right there's your answer. If you want to multiply it out any, you can say square root of 40 times square root of nine, two negatives multiplied to a positive, three times four is 12. And then all of that has the same denominator of 35. Okay. Yes, sir. September 10 on 5-5. Five, five. 10 on 5-5. Five, five. All right, fire when ready. Okay. Let's even add a few more. We haven't found the sine of two alpha either. Let's do both of those. Sine of alpha divided by two and sine of two times alpha. Let's find both of those even though they're not asked for it. So again, we've got to remember some of these identities. First, I'm going to draw the triangle in quadrant four. In quadrant four, Sine is negative because the y value is negative. So that means this length is negative two. The nine is the hypotenuse. X is gonna be a positive number in quadrant four, where x squared plus negative two squared is nine squared. So I have x squared plus four is 81. X squared is 77. So X is going to be the positive square root of 77. <laughs> so let me move this out of the way. So I have room to put the sine of alpha over two. The identity for the sine of alpha over two is that it's plus or minus the square root of one minus the cosine of alpha, all of that over two. And so that's plus or minus. Now from the picture, the cosine of alpha is going to be the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So that'll be the square root of 77 over nine. And then all of that's divided by two and that two is underneath the radical sign. And if you want something that's prettier to type into web work, you can multiply top and bottom of that fraction by nine. And you can write that maybe as nine minus the square root of 77 over 18. It's still not very pretty, but don't tell him that. He thinks he looks mighty fine. Without knowing how big angle alpha is in quadrant four, I really can't tell um, if I get the positive or negative root. For instance, if it said it's in quadrant four the way it said in the original problem. So if alpha is between three pi over two and two pi, now take that equation and divide everything by two so that I have a statement for alpha divided by two. That says that three pi over four is smaller than alpha over two, which is smaller than pi. That tells me exactly that this particular angle 
is it between three pi over four and pi, it tells me that it's in quadrant two. So if alpha is in quadrant two and I'm finding the sign, I'm sorry, alpha over two is in quadrant two, then the sign of alpha over two is a positive number. But since it just told us we're in quadrant four, then I can't absolutely be sure in which quadrant alpha over two is. For instance, what if alpha is a negative angle, like negative 30 degrees, then alpha over two is negative 15 degrees, and that's still in quadrant four, in which case the sign would be the <coughs> negative square root. So we weren't told explicitly the size of alpha, so I can't determine explicitly which quadrant alpha over two is in. See what I'm saying? So I got to keep plus and minus root here. Now I wanted to add a second part to this problem. I wanted to find the sine of twice alpha. So all we gotta do is expand that as two sine alpha cosine alpha. It's one of the identities that you'll have on a sheet of identities. You don't have to memorize it, but I can expand. The idea is we can expand sums, differences, double angles, half angles in terms of the single angles. And if you know the sine or cosine of one of the angles, you know them all. So here I got the sine of alpha is given as negative two ninths. The picture tells me that the cosine of alpha is square to 77 over nine. So it's just a matter of filling things in. And so I get negative four squared to 77, nine times nine gives me 81. So over and over and over, we've been doing essentially the same thing with our formulas. Write them in terms of the single angle, expand the problem that we're looking for, and then fill in the numbers. Easy schmeasy. Squeezy, easy, squeezy. I like that one. Anything else you need? All right, what do you say we jump to chapter six? I have a few chats. I have a lot of chats. My goodness. Can't I just ignore them? Number 10 on 5556 five, five, and number eight. And number eight, I don't know which ones those are. We did number 10, yay. Is in that we do it in the right section? We did, okay, check that one off. And number eight in 5455. Five. Okay, I guess I gotta look that one up. Number eight in 5455, five, five. did I bring that with me? I don't think I did. Because I thought you'd be all done with web work by now. Silly me. All right, let me look it up. Wrong one? Oh, 5354, five, number eight. Time to get caught up. <coughs> all right, I got to pull it up because I don't know what it is. Uh, move over, you silly thing. Yeah, we see this old screen in here. I want you up there. Backing you out. There she be. Web work, five, three, five, four. When we said number eight. First how to use five over thirteen. We're told that the sign of U is negative. And we want to find a bunch of stuff. <laughs> 
sine of u, sine of u minus pi, cosine of u minus pi. Good gosh, sine of u minus pi two. Cosine of u minus pi over two. All right, that looks like plenty to do. <coughs> over there. Okay. Cosine's positive, sine of that same angle is negative. That tells me exactly which quadrant I find angle u. Quadrant four, cosine's positive, sine is negative. So that's quadrant four. So we'll make another quadrant four triangle. Uh, cosine of u is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Do you recognize the 5, 12, 13 triangle? So this will be the negative 12 since it's going down. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. There she be. Sine of u minus pi using the identity. Sine goes sine, cosine, minus, cosine, sine. So sine u, cosine pi, minus cosine u, sine pi. Do you know the sine and cosine of pi? Sine of pi is? And cosine of pi? There we go. This is zero. This is negative one. Sine of u was negative 12 over 13. Cosine of u was given as five over 13. When I multiply those numbers pairwise, I get 12 over 13. Cosine of u minus pi, the cosine difference formula goes cosine, cosine plus sine, sine. So I get cosine u, cosine pi, plus sine u, sine pi. We've got all those numbers looking at us in the problem right above us. Cosine of u is five over 13. Cosine of pi is negative one. Sine of u is negative 12 over 13. Sine of pi is zero. So I get negative five over 13. Sine of u minus pi over two using that difference formula again, same formula as the first one. You go sine, cosine, minus, cosine, sine. So sine u cosine pi over two minus cosine u sine pi over two. So what about cosine of pi over two? Zero sine of pi over two? Good. If we play like a trig squid game, you get a few <laughs> seconds to answer, otherwise I blow your head off. <laughs> Ooh, the gore. <laughs> Except for there's no big ball of money up there. <laughs> Just a degree. <laughs> okay, so you said cosine pi over two was zero. Sine of pi over two is one. Sine of u is negative 12 over 13. Cosine of u is five over 13. So that multiplies to zero, that multiplies to five over 13, but I got the minus sign in between. Then the cosine of u minus pi over two, we go cosine, cosine, plus sine, sine, same identity as number two, cosine u, cosine pi over two, plus sine u, sine pi over two. Grab our numbers, five over 13, zero, <coughs> negative 12 over 13, one, and multiply away and you get negative 12 over 13. Okay. 
So if you feel like you're working the same problem over and over and over and over, by gosh, you are. In all five, four or five sections here of chapter five, write out the identity, draw the triangle, fill in the numbers. Right? That's really all we're doing. We good, everybody? All right, here come chapter six. We've been kind of building our trig repertoire toward chapter six. But we need one more bit of tools in our box of tools. And those are the inverse trig functions. So let me appeal to your algebra memories. What are inverse functions? <laughs> You're talking about like the f or like the g, g of x, f of x thing? Yeah, the g of x, f of x thing, inverse. If I want, if I take a number and raise it to the third power and I tell you what I got. Okay, I took a number and I raised it to the third power and I got 125. What number did I just raise to the third power? Do you know off the top of your head? Five, because five cubed is 125 or the cube root of 125 is five. The operation raising something to the third power can be undone by raising it to the one third power. X cubed and X to the one third are inverse functions of one another. They undo the rule and get you back the original input, right? So I'm gonna write that. So if f of x is equal to x cubed, its inverse is, well, we write the inverse with a superscript minus one, not to be confused with the power, is the cube root of x. Because if I take f inverse of f of x, means cube root of whatever I did with f of x, I get the original input back. Two functions are inverses of one another if we get the original input back when we do the composite function either in that way or in this way. If I apply the rule of f last, which is cubing, to the rule of f inverse, which was cube root, I get the original input back. So in general, the inverse of a one to one function The inverse of a one-to-one -one function f of x denoted f inverse of x is a function satisfying that f inverse of f of x is x and f of f inverse of x is x. It's a paint remover. You paint something up, you don't like the color, and you need to remove it. You get out the old turpentine, and boom, paint's gone. So I apply a rule of f, then I apply the paint remover to it, and I get back the original thingy. Now, the point is that these have to be one to one functions. A one to one function has the property that each x is mapped to one y and each y is mapped back to one x. 
like in cubing. If I take a function in cubic, there's only one value of that. And the cube root of a function is also a single value. Um, if you remember anything about one-to-one -one functions, or I'll state it right here. Okay, one-to-one -one function. Has the property. That each X is mapped to only one Y and each Y is paired with only one X. In order for something to be a function, each x has to go to one y. But for it to be one to one, each y all has to go to one x. So we see if something's a function by doing a vertical line test so that each x has only one y. If you have a graph of a, an expression and you pass a vertical line through it and that vertical line hits the graph at most once, then that's the graph of a function. But now I want to have the property that each y comes from only one x. So now I'll run a horizontal line through the graph of the function. If the horizontal line hits the graph, then there's only one y for that particular x and one x for that particular y. So for instance, here's a function. This is the y is equal to x cubed function. It looks something like that. It's a function because it passes the vertical line test, but it's one to one function because every time I draw a horizontal line, it hits the graph at most once. A function like a parabola is not one to one. Because I can find a horizontal line that hits that graph more than once. I can find a lot of them. But here's an example of one. There's my red. This horizontal line hits the graph for that X and for that X. So there are two X's that go to the same Y. If I want to undo squaring, then I have to know where the X's are that I've squared it. In other words, I got to cut that parabola in half in order to find its inverse. This one, that does matter. That's, I'm gonna define the inverse trig functions, which none of them are one-to-one. -one. If you think about all of our trig functions, they repeat their shape over and over and over. So I run a horizontal line there, not one to one. So to define the inverse trig functions, we're going to cut off the rep repetitive part and limit the domain over a single interval. For instance, I can find the inverse of x squared. I, I know if I square something and I want to undo it, I just take the square root of it. But I have to be careful because if I square a negative number, then I got to make sure that I, I undo that. So in order to define the inverse for something like this, of y is equal to x squared, we have to restrict the domain. Cut this parabola in half. For instance, for x greater than or equal to zero, then the function f of x is equal to x squared has inverse, f inverse of x is the square root of x. Here's that half of the parabola, y is equal to x squared. And here is its inverse, y is equal to the square root of x. 
if I choose the other half of the parabola for x less than zero, then its inverse is going to go in the other direction, turning about this way. So let me swap pages here. For x less than or equal to zero, here's the parabola, y is equal to x squared, and its inverse is going to have to go this way. Negative uh, square, sorry, square root of the opposite of x. Y values are still going to be positive, but I've got to take the opposite of x because now these x's are negative, and I need the opposite of x to be positive. So we get to specify where we are. <laughs> Let me remind you about some relationships between a function and its inverse. Um, if f is a one-to-one -one function, then its inverse undoes all of the pairings and gives you back, well, let me see. Let me see if I draw a picture. f takes an x from here, does the rule to it and gives you a y here. That's what f does. If it's one to one, f inverse starts with the y and gives you back that x. In other words, the outputs of f become the inputs of f inverse. And the inputs of f become the outputs of f inverse. If this ordered pair is on the graph of f, this ordered pairs on the graph of f inverse. So, so one of the first things I want to note is the domain of f is the range of f inverse, the range of f is the domain of f inverse. So what I just said is if the ordered pair AB is on the graph of f, then the ordered pair BA is on the graph of f inverse. So if AB is on the graph of f, then the ordered pair BA is on the graph of F inverse. Does that sound like stuff that you knew before? Geometrically, that means when you graph the two functions together f and f inverse on the same coordinate plane, then the graph of f inverse will simply look like the reflection of the graph of f about the line y is equal to x. For instance, let me give you an equation that you probably can graph real easily. Let's take this function, f of x is equal to three x minus six. What kind of graph does that have? Straight line, let's plot a few points. That's a linear function. When x is zero, y is negative six. So let me put zero negative six right here. When x is two, y is zero. And when x is four, y is positive six. 
So here's the graph of F. Now I'm going to show you how to find the graph of its inverse. The ordered pair X and Y is on the graph of F. In order to find F inverse, <coughs> swap them. Make the X's into Y's and the Y's into X's. So start with this, instead of using the F of X notation, now change the X's to Y, change X and Y, swap places. Make that an X, make that a Y. Now solve for this new Y value and the formula you get will be the formula for F inverse. So I, first thing I do to solve for Y is I add six. So I get X plus six is three times Y and then divide by three. And so my claim is that this is F inverse. And so I'll label it as such. F inverse of X is equal to X plus six over three. <coughs> And I'm going to ask you to plot each of the following points into this formula. Replace x with negative 6 and tell me what you get. Put a negative 6 right here. 0. Replace x with positive 6 and what do you get? And now replace x with 0. Do these ordered pairs look familiar? Here's the ordered pair 0, negative 6 on the graph of F. Negative 6, 0 is on the graph of F inverse. 6, 4 is on the graph of F. I plot now the ordered pair. I'm sorry, 4, 6 is on F. If I plot 6, 4, I've got a point on the graph of F inverse. That's probably not over far enough. And then zero, two here. Oops, I didn't plot that far enough. Let's scoot him over. So there's the graph of F inverse. It's a reflection of the graph about the line Y is equal to X. Here's the line Y is equal to X. It cuts right through the first quadrant. If I know the graph of F, and now I paint it with wet paint and then fold the paper along the diagonal Y is X and unfold it, the imprint that it leaves for me is the graph of F inverse. X's become Y's, Y's become X's. That's all stuff you knew, right? Now we're gonna do that for our trig functions. None of our trig functions are one-to-one. -one. So we will restrict their domains <coughs> so over that limited value of inputs that segment of the graph will be one to one and contain all the right numbers to represent that function and over those then we'll define the inverses. <coughs> So let's start with the sine function. I'm going to graph you the sine function for one whole period in each direction. So on the interval from negative two pi to two pi, y is equal to the sine of x looks like this. Let's go with a pi here and a two pi there. 
minus pi minus two pi. Hope you remember that one of the periods of the sine curve looks something like this. And then it does the exact same thing back here. Where the peak of it hits one and negative one at the pi over twos. But if you run a horizontal line through that, it's going to hit that graph several times, and it hits an entire graph an infinite number of times. But there's a piece of the graph that contains one and negative one and is one to one, several pieces, but the one by convention that's chosen is between negative pi halves and positive pi halves. See yellow visible? That little piece right there contains all of the range values of the sign between negative one and one and forms a one to one segment. So keep only on the interval from negative pi over two out to pi over two, we have a one-to-one -one function. Just abbreviate function with the F and the N. Who needs the letters in between? And we're gonna define the inverse sine. The inverse sine is a function that makes these X's into Y's and these y's into x's. This particular function here, I'm looking at um, x's between minus pi over two, and then the y's go between negative one and one. The inverse sine function swaps them, the sine of y becomes the x's. But nobody writes that, we write this. y is equal to the inverse sine of x. y is equal to the inverse sine of x is a function that takes the x's here, which were these guys, and gives me back the, the angle that I took the sine of. The inverse sine of a number between one and negative one is an angle that I take the sine of to get that number. So we usually write this as a two-pronged definition. Y is equal to the inverse sine of X means X is the sine of Y. So I write the word if and only if in here. And again, these y's are these guys. These y's here were the x's from before. They're numbers between negative pi over two and pi over two. And these x's were the numbers y up here. So x is always a number between negative one and one. The inverse sine of a number between negative one and one is an angle between minus pi over two and pi over two, if you think about the unit circle, that I would take the sine of to get those numbers. So let's grab some of those numbers. Let's see if you can find these. Find <coughs> the inverse sine of zero, the inverse sine of one, the inverse sine of negative one, the inverse sine of one half, the inverse sine of negative one half. The inverse sine of zero is an angle that we take the sine of to get zero. I'm in radian measure. 
The inverse sine of zero is an angle that I take the sine of to get zero. Well, the sine curve passes through zero, zero. So my answer here is zero. The inverse sine of one is an angle that I take the sine of to get one. Not just any angle, it's an angle between pi over two and minus pi over two. And when I look at that yellow piece of graph there, the ordered pair pi over two one is on the graph of the sine. So the ordered pair one pi over two is on the graph of the inverse sine. The answer I'm looking for here is the angle pi over two. And not five pi over two. It's got to be an angle that is either. This tells me that the angles that I'm giving out are either this way measured or this way measured. There's no such thing as an inverse sign giving me numbers of things from quadrant two or four or three, sorry. It's quadrant one or four, but they're all acute. So I want to know an acute angle, maybe, or an angle in my picture that I take the sign of to get negative one. It'll be negative pi over two and not three pi over two. There's no way an inverse sine is gonna spit out a value of three pi over two because we're not using the unit circle in that direction. All right, do you know an angle that I take the sine of to get a half? It is pi over six. So what do you think the inverse sine of negative pi half is? I'm sorry, the inverse sine of negative one half is. It's negative pi over six. And now I'm gonna graph you this particular inverse trig function. The graph of y is equal to the inverse sine of x. Let's see, I'm gonna graph it. I said my x's go between negative one and one. So here's x is negative one, here's x is one. This ordered pair is on the graph, it goes through zero, zero. It goes through one pi over two. So let me put pi over two up here. And this point at one pi over two is on the graph. Negative one, negative pi over two is on the graph. So if that's my scale, that point is on the graph. If X is one half, Y is pi over six. Pi over six is one third of the way to pi over two. So if I cut this into thirds, it might be somewhere right here. And at negative one half goes to negative pi over six. So that's gonna be about right here. And the graph of the inverse sine then looks something like this. Should be a little bit more concave down than I've drawn it. Something like that. Has no arrows on the end. It's just a little snippet of a graph. It has a terminal point at one pi halves and at negative one, negative pi halves. Concave upward in between, concave downward on the other side of that x-axis. The inverse sine function pulls things back from the sine and vice versa. <coughs> what I'm saying is that the uh, sine of the inverse sine of X will give me X and the inverse sine of the sine, I'm gonna use an A instead of an X. 
And the sine of the inverse sine of A will give me back A, provided those A's live in the right place. These guys here will always be between one and negative one. And these guys here will always be between pi over two and negative pi over two. These guys here will be between negative pi over two and pi over two. Oops, I just said that backwards, the other A's. Those are gonna be between pi over two and negative pi over two. And these are gonna be between one and negative one. These are between um, this A out here has to be between negative pi over two and pi over two. This one's going to be between one and negative one. Right, signs only spit out numbers between one and negative one. Inverse signs only spit out numbers between negative pi over two and pi over two. <laughs> For example, does anybody know the sign of pi thirds? It's a square to three over two. Now suppose I take the inverse sign of square to three over two. What do you think the inverse sign of square to three over two is? What's the angle that I just took the sign of to get square to three over two? <coughs> Pi thirds, sitting right there. What if I take the sine of two pi thirds? Don't I still get square to three over two? But the inverse sine of this square to three over two is not two pi thirds, it's always pi thirds. Two pi thirds is in quadrant two. The inverse sine will not spit out values in quadrant two. It'll spit out values in quadrant one or in quadrant four. I know the sine of seven pi over six is a negative one half. But the inverse sine of negative one half is not seven pi over six. There are no such things. The inverse sine spits out a number in quadrant one or quadrant four, less than pi halves. So this is going to be negative pi over six. So it peels the rule off and gives you back the acute angle that generates that particular value. Then remember the way we restricted the domain. Yes, sir. Yes. If you have a negative number inside the parentheses that you're taking the inverse sign of, you'll get the negative of the reference angle. If you have a positive number in there, you'll just get that reference angle. Things are going to get a little tricky with cosines, though. Let me do the same thing with cosines here. I'm going to draw your cosine between negative 2 pi and 2 pi. All right, so let's see, that's gonna be pi, two pi, the notches there are the pi halves. The cosine begins out at one, crosses at pi halves, hits negative one at pi, crosses at three pi halves, back to one. Then it does the same thing over here. but it's so not one-to-one. -one. Horizontal lines across that several times. 
but I've got to keep a portion of the graph that cuts, that contains all of the y values between one and negative one and is one to one. There are several places that you can do that, but by convention, we choose the interval from zero to pi. On the interval from zero to pi, that cosine function is one to one. And we can define the inverse cosine. The inverse cosine of an input value x is a number y if and only if <coughs> the cosine of that y gives you back x, where these y's are between 0 and pi. And these input values here are between negative one and one. The inverse cosine is going to give you back a quadrant one angle. If you're taking the inverse cosine of a positive number, it gives you a quadrant two angle. If you're taking the inverse cosine of a negative number. So when I represent these angles as the range of the inverse cosine, they are angles here. So I'm going to find the inverse cosine of all of our favorite angles. Let's look at the inverse cosine of 0 plus and minus 1. and the inverse cosine of plus and minus a half. The values of these are angles, either in quadrant one or in quadrant two. You can look at that yellow piece of graph and tell me what number, what angle, is it that I take the cosine of to get zero? On that yellow portion, cosine of what angle gives me zero? And that's the angle I'm looking for here. <coughs> it's that angle, right? So it's pi halves. The inverse cosine of zero is pi halves because the cosine of pi halves is zero. Got to think backwards. The inverse cosine of one is an angle that I take the cosine of to get one. And there it is right there. That would be zero. Inverse cosine of one is zero. Inverse cosine of negative one is an angle on that yellow graph that I take the cosine of to get negative one. What is it? Pi. Inverse cosine of negative one is pi right here. All right. Inverse cosine of one half is an angle that I take the cosine of to get a half. Pi over what? Pi over three. Now the inverse cosine of negative one half is an angle in quadrant two that I take the cosine of to get negative one half. What is that angle in quadrant two? It's gonna be a over three, two pi over three. Okay, you gotta know where you're living. This picture says the output values of my cosine are between zero and pi. 
Not down here, not down there, between zero and pi. And now I'm gonna graph the inverse cosine function. Again, the graph is only going to exist for x's between negative one and one. And I really didn't need to draw my axis down here because my y values, my outputs, are going to go between zero and pi. The inverse cosine of zero is pi halves. So when my input is zero, my output is pi halves. The inverse cosine of one is zero. The inverse cosine of negative one is pi. The inverse cosine of one half is pi thirds. That's gonna be about right here. And the inverse cosine of negative a half is a two pi thirds. And this graph is gonna be concave up over here and concave down in there. So let me move my point a bit. And that's it, no arrows again on the ends of the graph. Just that little snippet of a graph. So if I take the inverse cosine, say of the cosine of pi thirds, I should get back the pi thirds. If I take the inverse cosine, say of the cosine of <coughs> negative pi thirds, I will not get back negative pi thirds. There's no such thing. There are no such things. I do get back though, two pi thirds. Okay. So they peel each other off, but the output has to be in the specific range of that inverse trig function. The other one that I want to look at is the inverse tangent function. The inverse tangent function looks like this. Okay, so for uh, y is equal to the tangent of x. We have a bunch of pieces of the graph that look like the cube root things. But if we just consider one period of it, then we have a one-to-one -one function. For y is equal to inverse tangent of x, keep the interval between negative pi halves and positive pi halves to define the inverse tangent. This interval here is one period of the tangent function as those asymptotes at the pi halves. Do you remember that, don't you? Here's the graph of the tangent of x in one period, and it does pass the horizontal line test. But let me point out that when I keep my x's between negative pi halves and pi halves, my y's are between plus and minus infinity. And I'm gonna define my inverse tangent function to go like this. The inverse tangent of a number x is an angle y if and only if, there's my if and only if, I take out all unnecessary letters. Two, two f if is read if and only if. If and only if the tangent of that y gives you back x. Where these x's can be any number between minus infinity and infinity, but these y's are strictly between negative pi halves and pi halves. <clears throat> You're looking for angles that you would take the tangent of to give you those numbers. <clears throat> 
So for instance, suppose I want the inverse tangent of zero, the inverse tangent of one, maybe the inverse tangent of negative one, how about the inverse tangent, oh, I don't know, square root of three, inverse tangent of negative square root of three. Those are numbers that we know from our table of values. The inverse tangent of zero is an angle in between negative pi halves and pi halves that we take the tangent of to get zero. So here's the piece of the graph of the tangent function. It passes through the origin. So if zero, zero is on tangent, zero, zero is on inverse tangent. The angle that I'm looking for here is zero radians. Now let's put your little thinking caps on and tell me what angle I take the tangent of to get one. It is pi over four. So the inverse tangent of one is pi over four. Now I need an angle that I take the tangent of to get negative one, but it has to be an angle strictly between negative pi over two and positive pi over two, using the same range as the inverse sine. So that's gonna have to be negative pi over four, right? This one behaves just like the inverse sine. Now let's see, what angle do we take the tangent of to get the square root of three? Pi over three, because the sine would have to be square root of three over two, and the cosine would have to be a half. Cosine of pi over three is a half, so this is pi over three. So what do you think the tan inverse tangent of negative square root of three is? Negative pi over three. The only one you have to think about is the cosine. Because that one's in quadrant one and two. There are comparable definitions for the inverse secant, the inverse cosecant, and the inverse cotangent. We'll primarily work with these, but let me write down where we would restrict the domains. Our other three inverse trig functions. Let's start with the inverse cotangent y is equal to the inverse cotangent of x is a function that takes the cotangent of that number y to give us back x. And this one keeps everything between 0 and pi. The inverse secant y is equal to the inverse secant of x is a function that takes the secant of an angle y and gives me back x. That angle y for the inverse secant has to be between 0 and pi, but not pi over 2. And then the inverse cosecant is an angle that I take the cosecant of. Give me back that number x. Those angles for the inverse cosecant are between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, but not 0. I never remember those. I looked them up. And they have goofy looking graphs. But if you look at these, these y's follow the cosines. And the, these y's follow the cosines, but not pi halves. And these y's follow the signs. <laughs> 
the ones that follow the cosines are the trig functions that would have cosines in their definitions. A cotangent and a secant have cosines. So they're in quadrants one and two. And the cosecant strictly has a sign in it. I don't remember those because there is a relationship between these things. If you want to know the inverse secant of a number x, you can just find the inverse cosine of a number one over x. And if you want to know the inverse cosecant of a number x, well, guess what? You just find the inverse sine of a number one over x. And the same deal holds with the tangents. The inverse cotangent of a number x is cotangent, I said, t, is the tangent inverse of one over x. So if I can remember the ranges here, then I don't have to worry about those. And that's the way I typically do this. Now, trig existed once upon a time a long, long time ago. And all these things were written with superscripts like I've written them here with a minus one. Then we start typesetting things to write textbooks. And early typesetting didn't really have an exponent button. So these things were renamed as arc functions. The inverse sine function is sometimes called the arc sine. Arc cosine is the inverse cosine, and arc tangent is the inverse tangent. So the other notation is that the inverse sine of x is also called the arc sine of x. It's easy to typeset. The inverse cosine of x is the arc cosine of x, and the inverse tangent of x is the arc tangent of x. Same thing with the other three guys. So when you see that arc in front of your trig function, interpret it as the inverse of. <clears throat> Have you seen these guys before? Never, ever, ever? <clears throat> Not like they're wandering around Lubbock or anything. <clears throat> We need these because sometimes we have to solve trig equations, which we're going to do for the rest of the chapter. And maybe it's not one of our known angles. Like I can take a value, I can take a cosine of an angle and it'll spit out a number between one and negative one. But if it's not one that I know, suppose I want to know, um, let's see, suppose I take the cosine of some number and I get one third. And I want to know what number did I just take the cosine of? Well, I can approximate it with a calculator using a button called the inverse cosine button. And that solution would be written like this. X is the arc cosine of one third. Your calculators would look like this, cosine inverse of one third. So it gives us exact solutions to these types of trig equations where this number on the right hand side is not one of our favorites. Zero, square to three over two, square to two over two, a half or one, but is still a number between one and negative one, a viable solution, right? If I wanna know what number did I take the tangent of to get 50? Well, that number would be the inverse tangent of 50, and I have an inverse tangent button on my calculator. It's a second function button, and it'll approximate this angle for me in radians or degrees, depending on how my calculator is set. So we're gonna use that idea in solving trig equations. We also have trig identities. Um, we've got the trig identities that we've been using, sums and differences and things like that. Um, let me show you what I mean. I got about five minutes. 
suppose I want to take the I want to take the cosine of the inverse sine of two thirds. All of our inverse trig functions represent angles. The inverse sine of two thirds is an angle between minus pi halves and pi halves that I would take the sine of to get two thirds. It's not one of the angles in my table, but I know it's an angle. If I know the sine of one <coughs> angle, I should know the cosine of that angle. So I can find the exact value of the cosine of the inverse sine of two thirds without ever knowing the angle. Is that right, triangle trigonometry? I tell myself this thing in the parentheses is an angle. It's some angle that I would take the sine of to get two thirds. And now my job is to find the cosine of that very same angle. Well, I know that this angle has to be in quadrant one because this is a positive number. The sine represents the opposite over the hypotenuse. The cosine of that angle is going to require the adjacent side. So we go through the little motions of finding the length of the adjacent side. That x squared plus two squared is three squared. So I get x squared plus four is nine. X squared is five. So x is the positive square root of five. That tells me the cosine of the inverse sine of two thirds is the square root of five over three. I can find all six trig functions of any angle. So let's try it again. Let's look at finding the secant of the inverse cotangent of negative 15 over eight. Well, cotangent has a um, cosine in it. So I know this angle in the parentheses here, I'm gonna call it A again, has to be a quadrant two angle. Because remember the inverse cotangent has that kind of range. So I draw my triangle showing a quadrant two angle that I would take the cotangent of to get negative 15 over eight. Using my right triangle trigonometry, I know these two numbers represent adjacent over opposite. So my adjacent's the negative 15, the opposite's the positive eight. If I need the secant of that angle, then I'm going to need the hypotenuse. So I find the hypotenuse, leg squared plus leg squared is hypotenuse squared. Ah, they went my pen. Only lost the tip of it. That kind of bites. Eight squared is 64. 15 squared is 225. Let's see, that looks like a 289 is C squared. C is gonna be 17. Using that picture, the secant of that particular angle is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So it's negative 15 over 17. Okay. Any of that make sense? All right, we're gonna use these inverse trig functions next time when we solve trig equations.